Hey guys, I am really excited to be uh, here having um, some time with my friend Peak Portal. He and his wife Sarah are part of leading a community in Manenberg, Cape Town. Uh, if you guys know anything about Cape Town, it is one of the most um, divided cities in the world in terms of wealth and poverty. Uh, Pete is from the UK and together with his wife moved into Manenberg where they help lead a church called Tree of Life and a community that is really impacting into one of the most difficult um, uh, communities in South Africa that has been governed by crime, drugs, murder, violence, you name it. Um, and they have got some stories. The thing I love about Pete and Sarah is the apostolic grace that's on their life. They have this ability not just to pioneer. We often talk about the apostolic being pioneering, uh, which I agree with. But one of the things I love about them is they carry a, a heart to love on, care for, and to be a mom and a dad to a community that has not experienced that. And they're raising something of, uh, of a kingdom family dynamic that has been incredible. So Pete, special welcome to you. Thanks. Um, Part of this is to really help shape uh, your thinking around the prophetic and to shape your thinking around what God is doing in terms of the kingdom. And so that's why I'm going to be just having a little bit of an interview style with Pete. I'm telling you, you're going to have an incredible blast. Pete, why didn't you lead in with anything you want to tell us about yourself and Sarah and what's happening in Manimba? Yeah, thanks. Um, hi, everyone. Great to be with you all. Um, so I'm originally from London, uh, the UK and have been in South Africa now for 13 years. Um, so I moved to South Africa straight out of university pretty much after a brief stint uh, in kids TV at the BBC in London. And yeah, we, we um, Cape Town as you mentioned is racially and economically one of the most divided uh, 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 cities in South Africa in the world and we followed Jesus to a community called Manenberg, which is 20 kilometers outside the city center. And Manenberg shouldn't exist. Manenberg was conceived of and built by the white supremacist apartheid government in the 1960s um, for those it deemed non-white. And um, anyway, uh, today, as Julian mentioned, drugs and gangs and poverty and uh, a, a high level of despair. Uh, prevail. There is obviously a whole other story, and a, there's brilliant stuff going on in Manenberg as well. But um, we, yeah, we felt Jesus say, "Will you come follow me to Manenberg?" And uh, we did that um, in our current setup eight years ago, and a part of leading a church that ministers to um, drug addicts, gang members, at-risk teenage girls, and those of other faiths as well. Manenberg's about forty percent Muslim, so we're seeing. Um, people from other faiths coming to know Jesus as well. Pete, so one of the things I love about you is how you have learned how to hear God's voice in what looks like some of the most despairing contexts. Uh, one of the things I love to tell our guys is that we have to become prophets of hope, people right. who declare hope right. into the worst places because if the gospel doesn't work in the worst places, it can't work in the so-called best places. Um, can you maybe just lead with a story or a moment where you just heard God speak into something that looked quite despairing and just some of the fruit that came out of it? And I just yeah. want to say it's not all glamorous just before we all get there in terms of let's go to the high mountaintops. Um, I think the reality is hearing God in the valley is a beautiful thing. So. Mm. Yeah, well, I guess um, the first thing that comes to mind is the home that Sarah and I now live in. It was... Um, owned by uh, two Muslim brothers uh, who are part of an organization called PAGAD, which stands for People Against Gangs and Drugs, uh, which was a vigilante organization known in the 90s for firebombing uh, drug dealers' houses and um, killing gang leaders uh, in the name of kind of um, uh, Islamic zeal, uh, shall we say. And um, we bought this house from... Um, these brothers, uh, two very sweet men, and um, but it was what you would euphemistically call a renovator's dream. <laughs> um, <laughs> the roof was all messed up, the windows were shoved uh, with uh, newspaper and bricks, Gosh. the cavity wall on the outside was leaking, um, so there was rising damp, the plumbing was shot, the electricity was all out. Um, and we felt the Lord say to us, if you give me everything you've got, 
I will give you everything you need to turn this kind of pile of bricks into a home and habitation for my Holy Spirit. Um, and so we, we went all in. Sarah um, had inherited some money. Her mother sadly passed away from cancer a couple of years prior. And so we just went all in. We said, right, we'll, we'll, we, and literally everything we had in the bank, we paid for this um, joke of a house, really. And we were told we were throwing our money away. We were told um, we were idiots. We were told it was going to be a financial black hole. Um, but over the course of the next year, the Lord provided absolutely everything we needed um, to uh, renovate the place, uh, to turn it into a home. And since then, that was 2014. And since then, um, up to now, we've had about, I lose count, but about 50 to 60 young men seeking help coming out of gangs and drugs come and live with us and see that promise fulfilled. Come on, come on. Guys, I, I just love Whenever I've been to um, Pete and Clara's home in Mangenberg, in fact, I, I come from that area in many ways, and I've got family that live in Mangenberg. So it's just incredible to see what God's actually doing on the ground. Not only is the, the space that they've created um, beautiful in many ways, it, it's a thin space. It's a space where you can encounter God, and I love that sense of the presence of God attached to some physical land, some physical property, because God actually is pretty concerned about the physical land yeah. too being a space that people can encounter him on. Um, coming into the USA, some of you guys have heard me tell the story. I landed in Boston the week that George Floyd um, protest kicked off. Right. And it was absolutely crazy because it took me back to the 80s in South Africa, in Cape Town in particular, where there were massive riots and it was a really tricky, um, uh, violent space to grow up in as a kid and uh, actually brought back some traumatic memories for me that God has had to help me reprocess again. And uh, in that process for me, Pete, I felt like a, a high level of anger and a sense of, I want justice right yeah. now. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the sense of uh, something has to shift, something has to change. We can't just keep saying wonderful prophetic words without any clarity of change yeah. happening. And I became actually quite angry and militant in my own thinking. And God really had to help me process some of that before I opened my mouth publicly because I would have got into a lot of trouble. <laughs> yeah, um, add to the noise, yeah. But one of the things I'm noticing in the body of Christ is the extreme polarization around hyper-spirituality, where all we do is prophesy, say words, um, revival culture, let's go for more, and no practicality of actually revival bringing about reformation, change, transformation, restitution, genuine breakouts. And then the other extreme with some of my friends, um, both in South Africa and outside of South Africa who are like, we don't care about the church, we need to deconstruct, we need to just go after justice and, yeah. and mercy, people need to change, we need to, you know, just the whole kind of militant dynamic of a social justice that seems to be void of the presence of Jesus, to be honest. Right. Um, and we've obviously spoken a lot about this. Yeah. Tell me a little bit about what you're thinking around how do we actually practically apply the kingdom of God and prophetic, a sense of prophetic revelation. I think to be a prophet or to prophesy, you need to bring justice and mercy. Yeah. It was the primary job of the prophetic, both in the Old and the New Covenant. Um, unpack some of your thoughts around that. Yeah, it's, it's one of the, I think, most problematic theological dichotomies. Um, it's a dichotomy that has caused me a lot of desolation and pain as I have kind of pendulum swung between activism and revivalism and, uh, you know, on the one hand in the revivalist kind of camp you've got uh, people full of faith and full of joy and, you know, God's always in a good mood, ha ha ha, and but kind of oblivious to the fact that 29,000 children are dying every day of curable diseases in Africa, and is he in a good mood about that, really? Um, but on the other side, you've got uh, the social justice activists who are saying the church is all hypocritical, um, we need to decolonize this, we need to do this, we need to do that. Um, and I see friends in that camp, um, I see um, anger, I see depression, I see despair, and I see um, sort of ad hominem attacks. So. 
uh, we're told the battle's not against flesh and blood, but often uh, I see uh, people reverting to battles against flesh and blood in the activist camp. So I think what we need to do and what I long to uh, embody in my life and in our church is that we need the personal prophetic to fuel the systemic pr pr prophetic. Brilliant. And what I mean by that is if all the, 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 the systemic prophetic is saying, the systems of this world are flawed. We live in a fallen world. Um, necessarily, um, the arrangements of uh, uh, politics and other things are flawed. They're human projects. Mm. And so the systemic prophetic looks to, uh, as God is making all things new, breathing the new life and the new prophetic imagination into structures, institutions, and power dynamics of society in general as well as, for example, as you say, changing the, um, the record so that, we're, uh, so that we're listening to those voices that for, for years and centuries have been uh, either deliberately silenced or preferably unheard. Mm. So I, I'm not sure about that term, the voiceless. Everybody has a voice, but we have deliberately silenced certain voices or we have preferred not to hear them. So the systemic prophetic longs to breathe the life of the Holy Spirit into systems and structures. But if that's not fueled by the personal prophetic, and what I mean by that is what words of destiny, what words of spiritual DNA, of identity over your life, over your calling, over your ministry, are you holding and stewarding? Because we all need that. If we try and invade the, invades the wrong word, redeem the systemic prophetic without uh, knowing who we are, what God's tasked us with, his commission over our life, and the joy of the Holy Spirit, we are not only going to cause more harm than good, but we're also going to cause ourselves and our families, our churches, and our ministries more harm than good. Um, and so we need to be pursuing the personal prophetic. But if it, if it just ends up there, I've got my list of personal prophetic words that I'm stewarding and I'm sitting on. I feel kind of a, a level of entitlement to mm. my Jesus, my destiny, my healing, my journey. And guess what? Jesus becomes the kind of um, self-help guru on the periphery of me, the protagonist of my life. And that's the danger, I think, of Ooh. only the personal prophetic. Preach. And so the personal prophetic needs to um, flow into visions for systemic prophetic. They, the two need each other. Oh, my gosh. I feel like there's a whole lot of revelation there, right, guys? <laughs> I, 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 I cannot underscore or um, uh, if that's the right word, I cannot emphasize anymore just this idea of the, the prophetic that in genuinely shapes the systemic and then personal prophetic feeling that I think that's just such a powerful, helpful joining. Um, one of the things I, I've noticed, particularly here in America, but it's true of um, pretty much every nation I've lived in. I've lived in South Africa, England, and America, and I've noticed the idea or the thought that um, our nation's the best nation, right. um, and uh, the church is called to rule and to reign and to take over every system, over every context, and then the kingdom will come and everything will be changed. And uh, one of the things you guys will know if you've done Vox Day or being involved in any of the stuff that I do, that I often talk about how our filters impact how we prophesy. And I feel like we're in a season where the greatest reformation is on us as a church and as a people. And the reformation actually has to do with the right understanding of the kingdom of God. Right. Um, and, and one of the things that I love, you talk about a third way yeah. that breaks beyond um, some of the more um, explicit traditional ways we've seen the interface between social justice, the kingdom of God, and the church. Um, I'd love you to comment, particularly around what's a very popular theology in our world here in the States, and I think actually has spread all over around dominion theology and seven mountains that we all got to be at the top of a mountain and right, then everything's right, going to change. Right. And if we can just legislate the kingdom of God, finally things will change. Um, give us a little, some of your thoughts and maybe just some of the practical ways that you're actually seeing change come yeah. because of how you're living this stuff out. Yeah, I mean, huge topic. Question. Yeah, but it's great. <laughs> so one of my favorite quotes I came across um, recently was, is, uh, that the church is often a bit like a swimming pool. All the noise comes from the shallow end. And 
for me, influence is not so much about volume and noise. It's actually about how we navigate the depths. Um, and Cape Town is, you know, the, the, as I say, you're, you're thrown in in Cape Town in the deep end of racial segregation, historic injustice and economic inequality. So we're having to learn how to swim in the deep end. Um, and also having to learn how not to judge those splashing around in the shallow end because judgment is never generative. Um, rather than, I mean, this is another thing. Rather than asking what is wrong, we need to be asking what is missing. Come because on. if we ask what is wrong, we are automatically in judgment and we're automatically in a kind of holier than thou uh, 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 mindset. If we ask what is missing, we're actually fueling the creativity of the prophetic imagination. So that's the first thing. Um, but Seven Mountains theology, yeah. Okay, let me just go with that. I've got a, I've got a problem with it. Um, but rather than saying what's wrong with it, I want to ask what's missing. And what's missing is, I believe, that if you read Isaiah 40, Isaiah talks about preparing the way of the Lord. So we're saying, God, your kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. So, and he says, great, I'm making all things new. Uh, will you prepare the way of the Lord? And what does Isaiah say will be the hallmark of the preparing of the way of the Lord? He says that every mountain will be made low and every valley will mm. be raised up. So what that suggests to me is that if I am pursuing climbing the ladder of mountain influence in one of the seven mountains of society, the preceding the coming of the Lord, those mountains are going to be made low. The valleys are the things that are going to be raised. And so then that begs the question, well, what might the valleys in society be? And uh, my friend Bob Ekblad speaks on this, and he suggests that the valleys of society might be something like psychiatric wards, informal settlements, prisons, the homeless, old people's homes, refugee camps and drug dens. What if the church said we want to infiltrate with prophetic love, revivalist spirit and a, a sense of compassion and social justice, those seven valleys of society? Don't we think that if we gave our lives to pursuing influence in those spheres, actually we would have a much greater prophetic influence in society than being known for trying to get our man in the White House that or our brilliant. people at the top of the pile? And ultimately, if you read Philippians, the idea of kenosis is Jesus emptying himself of any entitlement to equality with God. And he became nothing, took on the nature of a servant. That, I believe, is what is missing from the church's mandate in these times. That as the coming of the Lord happens and as we hasten and prepare the ground, we will see valleys raised up. But that's not going to happen automatically. That's lives laid down. That's whole callings redirected into the dark valleys of society. My gosh, my brain is going right now because there's so many things around what they're actually supposed to look like, uh, particularly because the vast majority of prophetic movements have understood influence to be how many people follow me on Instagram, right. how many people right. get my books and all those things. I, I'm talking to me. I'm, I'm guilty of, of some of the stuff that I, I've equated influence with numbers or yeah. being at the top of something and this idea of getting low and getting slow to lift up um, uh, the marginalized society is is incredible you're, you're talking to a largely uh, prophetic audience people right. who aspire to be prophetic and desire to that what are some of the kind of big um, rocks of values that has shaped your prophetic worldview. Because I, 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 one of the things I love about um, Pete is he's often given me um, incredible prophetic insights just in conversation, and I have to then go home and repent and change the way I think. Um, and the thing I also love about Pete is he's not a grumpy social justice man. He, <laughs> I can be very grumpy. Um, well, you're mostly happy, to be fair. Mostly. Um, and, and just seeing the joy that governs his family, that governs uh, how he and Sarah work, and, and carrying joy and pain together, I think is an incredible mystery. Yeah. Um, but you do that so well. Um, so maybe just like one or two rocks, particularly in terms of this prophetic, blur that's happening in the church today yeah. uh, because God's intentionally wanting to dismantle previous ways of doing the prophetic. What are some of the big rocks that have shaped you? I think a big rock that shaped me is the, um, is 
interrogating what we mean by a kingdom culture.、Mm. Now, kingdom culture. What we what what I had always kind of essentially been told is that it's a flat pack formula from some North American mega church where they're seeing signs and wonders or something like that, and you have to just kind of copy all of that, assemble it like an IKEA cabinet. And then that that will that's the answer, right? Christians love formulas, don't we? We 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 want to create rules out of grace and all the rest of it.、Yeah. That's a whole other podcast. <laughs>、um, but what I mean, realizing in our cross-cultural church expression in Manenberg, where we have those of us who've relocated into the community and those who've grown up in the community, where we've had those who've grown up in、uh, Islam but have come to know Jesus, others who have spent two decades in addiction and are now clean, others who have masters in、um, social studies or theology, and others who dropped out of school grade twelve or whatever, or age twelve rather.、Um, what I'm realizing is that. For the for the fertile ground of the prophetic to really、um, prosper and flourish, is that we need to reevaluate what we mean by a kingdom culture. And so、mm. I need to、uh, examine my cultural loyalties to being a white British class educated man, in the same way that someone else will need to examine their cultural loyalties to being whatever. They are that make them up in the in in the physical, and as we strip ourselves of anything sub kingdom, we can actually pick up the things that are kingdom from each、Brilliant. other's cultures, and then together we repent of the sub sub kingdom loyalties. We take up each other's beautiful expressions of the kingdom in different ethnicities, tribes, nations, tongues, and cultures. And then, when we look around the room, what we see is a unique expression of the kingdom that is unique to the makeup of what God is doing in our people in this time and in this place. And we've not just copied some book from a completely other context, ripped it out, and tried to plonk it there. And what I've seen is that as that happens, then you begin to get. A multiplicity, in the good sense of the word, a diversity of prophetic voices, and、uh, that are feeding into the destiny of your local community. I love that. I love that.、Um, just in terms of something that you mentioned, and I, you know, hopefully at the end we'll have some time just to prophesy over some people. We'll do some prophetic ministry if we get there in terms of the time. I hope you guys are enjoying this. I. I'm feeling so stirred、um, and challenged in terms of how we're seeing things.、Um, one of the things you just threw out there was this concept of kenosis,、mm. Jesus not being entitled to equality.、Um, it seems like one of the highest values of society is the pursuit of equality,、yeah. um, the pursuit of my voice, my equal say, my equal everything.、Mm. Um, and there's something about The kingdom that has incarnated something different.、Yeah. Maybe just a little bit more thoughts. I feel like we've got a whole generation of、um, entitled people out there who、yeah. are like give me what I want, what I deserve, as if、yeah. we deserve anything, because all we get we get by way of grace anyway.、Mm. Um, some thoughts. Well, yeah, I don't think. <clears throat> sorry, I don't think equality is necessarily a kingdom value. And I'm aware that that can sound、Whoa. right, right, right. Hold the phone.、Um, I don't think equality is necessarily the necessarily word is important because、yeah. if you disagree with me, I said necessarily.、Um, I don't think it's necessarily a kingdom value, but I do think that equity is. And what I mean by this is that when I look at how Jesus treated and ministered to people, he didn't actually treat everybody the same. If he did, he would have had a formula for exactly how to heal a. Blind person, and he treats them all different.、Uh, and depending on who you read on this, and what your kind of level of knowledge or kind of uh, uh, research into the different ways he heals people,、um, are that a, a lot of the time he would be undoing things in their past. So he would be, in the true meaning of the word so, so saving, healing, and delivering them.、Uh, not just that they would get their eyesight back, but actually they'd be delivered from traumatic memories, right? And so if I,、uh, but、wow. then. But then, if I look at for, so, so first thing, he doesn't treat us all the same. Yes, he does in one sense. I get that we're all forgiven, we're all set free, we all have eternity with him. Hallelujah! But 
Within that, he doesn't treat us all the same because in the same way that God is not colorblind, treating us all the same in some kind of gray, uh, kind of equal five out of 10 mm -hmm. treatment, he delights in uh, race and culture and ethnicity and all the rest of it. But then if you look at the story of um, Jairus' daughter and the bleeding woman, um, just to unpack that a little bit, to explain what I mean by equity. Jairus comes to Jesus and says, help me, help me, my daughter's sick. Jesus is on his way to help Jairus when the woman um, who's been bleeding for 12 years, who would be ceremonially unclean, would have been cursed, would have been thrown outside the city walls, would have been uh, marginalized, she had spent everything she had, she was getting worse, um, accursed by God. She touches the hem of his garment. He feels power leave his body. And then what happens? And this was the bit that I had to realize. He obviously, Jesus isn't into public shaming. But he says, who did that? Even though he knew who did that. And as, remember, he's on the way to heal Jairus, mm. the uh, powerful man's daughter. But he makes Jairus, the powerful man, wait so that the woman who's now healed can tell what uh, is what Mark writes as her whole truth. She told him the whole truth. Wow. Now, if you're a woman in that society who'd been bleeding for 12 years and at the bottom of the rungs of the, lad the social ladder, that is a whole lot of truth that she needed to let out. And obviously in doing that, you can imagine Jesus sitting there maybe, like down on her level, and you can imagine everyone around stopping. You can imagine tears as she's telling all these stories and all this disappointment and despair. But you can also imagine Jairus standing there, this important man who's never been made to wait. And here's this uh, Jesus figure sitting with this woman in the dust, listening to her whole truth. You can imagine then when this Jairus' servant comes to him and says, Master, don't bother the rabbi anymore. Your daughter's dead. You, can you imagine how angry, the desolation Jairus would be feeling. He's never had to wait before, and the one time he's had to wait, his daughter dies. Now Jesus gets up, we know the end of the story. He goes and he raises Jairus' daughter from the dead, because it's no more supernatural to raise the dead than it is to heal the sick in the Holy Spirit. But the point of the whole story for me is that where society would put a man at the center of this, Jesus actually makes him wait and treats this bleeding woman at the bottom of wow. the pile as the VIP in the story who gets to tell her whole truth and in doing that and seeing Jesus's endorsement of her publicly is restored back to her place in society. That for me is kingdom. It's not treating everybody equally. Sorry. That's I a bit of a monologue. I'm Sorry. It's mind just, yeah. blowing. Guys, I... <clears throat> I, I, want, I want you to understand that this is going to shape the way you prophesy over people in an incredible way. And right. it, it, this idea of, of um, stopping for the one um, who seems inconsequential uh, is just so powerful because no mm. one really is inconsequential in the kingdom. Right. Um, I think um, I'm, I'm a bit speechless just partly because I'm being ministered to right now. I'm thinking, oh, Lord <laughs> Jesus, help my heart. Um, um, I, I'd love to hear some of your thoughts just in terms of um, what it looks like to carry hope yeah. in an overwhelmingly despairing context mm. um, and what it looks like to see fruit and redefining some of that. Yeah. So we cannot be a prophetic people if we're not carrying and stewarding hope, you know. Uh, we must have heard it millions of times. I have no idea. Everyone claims to have said this first. You see so many different names under this quote, but it's the confident expectation that God's good is on its way, mm -hmm. right? And, um, and so we need to have hope. Uh, and the days I wake up feeling hopeless, actually, I'm, I, I'm, I'd be better off not leaving the house. In fact, I'd be better off locking myself somewhere so that yeah. Sarah and Simi, my daughter and my wife, don't have to uh, put up with my hopelessness. But hope for me is hard fought for. Hope is not cheap optimism. Mm. Hope is not a religious varnish glossed onto the top of agony. I see it so often. 
in churches where people are jumping up and down, shouting hallelujah, screaming praise. But underneath you can just see the eyes are slightly dead and there's a whole pit of agony and trauma. And, so, and that is not hope. That is religious form. And that is, and anyway, that's a whole, again, a whole other thing. For us, hope means that we want to be successful, right? We want a holy ambition. Now, here's the thing. We don't do what we do because it's effective. We do what we do because it's our truest response to following Jesus in the world's most divided city. Can you say that, that little statement again? Like, so it's so actually, I, it's, I've, I've nicked that from a, um, from a theologian called Stanley Hauerwas, and he says, don't do it because it's effective, do it because it's true. Wow. Right? The world will go, the, the world will justify any means as long as the end can kind of justify it. So it kind of goes in reverse. But what the kingdom says is, don't you dare worry about the end if you are um, uh, trampling over people mm. in the means to get to that end. The world will say, you're a self-made person. Look at you, you're ruthless. And the kingdom says, you fool. The means is everything. The mm. journey is everything, not the destination. Who we are becoming is much more valuable to God than what we accomplish. Therefore, if we are to steward hope in a community that is known for despair, like I can tell you the facts about Manenberg that drug-related crime has risen by 600% in the last 12 years. Now, if I meditate on that for too long, I'm not going to be fooled with hope. Mm. I can tell you the number of young men who we've loved with everything we've got, who have robbed us blind, who have um, relapsed, who are worse than they are before, and who are back in jail and who have made more people pregnant and have got more bullet wounds. I can tell you all of that, that is fact. But the truth is that their stories are not finished. And the truth is that we can generate hope when we learn to define success upon kingdom values, not upon the world's metrics. So let me give you an example. We have had, as I said, between 50 and 60 young men come and live with us in Manenberg uh, uh, since 2014 when we opened our home to gangsters and drug addicts. And of those 50 or 60 people, about five or six of them are currently following Jesus and clean from drugs and doing okay. So you say, okay, so you've got a 10% success rate. Sure, but hear me out. What if somebody says to us, what's your success rate in terms of souls saved to dollars given, right? A grotesque notion, but one that funders come to us with. Mm. How many, essentially asking, how many addicts can I get for $1,000? Mm. Horrible. And we would say that is, we, we would say just, just keep quiet. No, we don't, we don't want to do that. Or you could say, how many of the young men who came to live with us made a verbal commitment to follow Jesus? Uh, about 95%, all but about two or three. Then you could say, how many of them are all still following Jesus? I'd say far fewer. Or you could say, how many of those young men who came into your home did you open the door to, uh, welcome with open arms, give whatever you could of yourself and love unconditionally? And I'd say 100%. Wow. So that is when Sarah said once to a funder who asked us about our success rate and she eyeballed him and just said 100% successful and she explained that we've never been asked by Jesus to get people off drugs, we've never been asked to um, get them out of gangs, we've been asked to open our home to those that society has written off because we believe that nobody belongs in jail but everybody believes in, uh, belongs in family. Wow. <laughs> Again, I, I, I hope this is putting some fortitude and hope in you in terms of your unique call and the things that God's called you to mm. in terms of the prophetic purpose that actually we've got to redefine everything. If we don't, we're going to just consistently be on this performance wheel yeah. of treadmilling to get more, to do more. And that is the curse of the prophetic movement at the moment, right. that it's all about more, 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 more rather than faithful, faithful, faithful. And I think there's some, I mean, there's such incredible wisdom in that. Um, Pete, I'd love you to share um, what this looks like. You're like, you know, forgive me for being direct. I think I'm allowed to. Um, you're a white kid from England who has um, understood what it's like to live first world and in the third world, 
majority of our guys come from a or developing world, sorry. Majority of our guys come from, you know, quote unquote Western context. What are some of the key things that help you connect your heart and can help our guys connect our heart, particularly in terms of prophetic prayer, praying for spaces and prophetic words into um, developing world context into the marginalized in society, um, specifically even into the spaces that they think appear wealthy, yeah. but actually need some of God's hope? Great question. The, the answer in a word is proximity. And what I mean by that is um, there's, a, <laughs> there's a funny cartoon I was once saying. It's a bit goofy, but I really like it. And it's a cartoon of a rhinoceros wearing a French beret uh, with a uh, thing of paints and a paintbrush. And in front of him, or her, it's unclear whether it's a female or male rhinoceros, to be fair, let's just call him him. In front of him is a canvas that he's painting of the view that you can see behind him. He's in, you know... Um, uh, the bush in South Africa, say. And right smack bang in the middle of his canvas is this big grey triangle. And you think, what? But that's not in the view. But then if you look further in the cartoon, strewn on the floor, uh, uh, a canvas of the Eiffel Tower that has a big grey triangle in front of it. Or another one is of a beach uh, and the ocean with a big grey triangle in front of it. And you've guessed it, the point of it is that for this artistic rhinoceros, every view he sees has his horn in front of his eyes, in front of the view. Yeah. And the point of this is to say that it's not so much what we're looking at as much as what we're looking with and where we're looking from. So we can critique that rhino for putting his horn in all the pictures, but for him, that is his reality 100% of the time, right? Mm. And for us, we can prophesy from places of distance, we can prophesy into issues, we can prophesy um, at arm's length, but I really think, from my point of view, it's when we choose people over issues Ooh. that the issues begin to choose themselves. Come on. And so, as I have chosen people, and praise God, over time, they have chosen me. And, you know, Manenberg is my, it, you know, our church community is my family. Um, as that has happened, the issues pick themselves in proximity to the hurting, the marginalized, the lost. Um, and so I do think that our prophetic voices will be and should be molded by proximity to uh, people. That's not to say you can't. You know, I, it's not to say that that's the only way, but that is what I have found has um, deepened my ability and my um, prophetic anointing. I, I mean, I, again, I think there's so much uh, grace on that and power in what you're saying, particularly living this incarnational dynamic and the proximity is such a big deal. Right. Um, and, and, you know, to be 100%, it's, it's why sometimes even this uh, dynamic of being on a call, uh, watching what we're saying, doesn't always produce the massive amount of fruit. I'm, I do no illusion that actually it's when you're in community. I'm going to produce the best prophetic people around me because we're in proximity right. and I'm going to be the best prophet because I'm in proximity to the issues that I'm trying to prophesy into and I'm trying to shape it's so important I want to encourage you just in terms of your own communities to be thinking where do I need to get into proximity where do I need to incarnate something where do I need to live out of something it's so so important and, and really um, I think it's one of the biggest things in the prophetic movement that we have to redress um, because the reality is when you study even the prophetic life, these were prophets who were connected to a very real Israel, to a very real people, to very real circumstances. And we need to be able to prophesy into that. Um, Pete, just as we're coming in for a bit of a landing, I'd love some of your... Um, I'm trying to figure out how to put this nicely. Give us... <laughs> Give us some key warnings. Right. So, like, I'm just aware that my world is filled with um, prophetic ministry and prophetic models very often 
that seems so disconnected from the Bible and disconnected from the Jesus that I see in the Bible. Right. Um, what do, you, what do you mean by that? Just oh, now you're getting me into well, just trouble. Well, just be specific. I um, want to be able to answer your question. Guys, please get me into trouble. I think in terms of how Jesus views politics, how Jesus views the marginalized, how right. Jesus views women, how mm. Jesus views the religious, how Jesus views um, money um, mm. and resources. Mm. All of those seem very often seem very disconnected from Scripture. Right. And we we have a health, wealth, name it, blab it, grab it, let me bless you with a prophetic word, just decree your way out of debt and it will all be fine. Um, but often disconnected. And where I'm genuinely wanting prophetic communities that carry something, mm. they actually reveal something of Jesus. So Mm. Just some ideas, thoughts, maybe ramblings. I often try and use these moments to externally process and then apologize later if I need to. Um, but mm. I don't know how to answer that. I mean, maybe a couple of garbled thoughts that you can interrupt me when I go too fully off it. But I, I think there are... I'm, I'm always struck by the story in John chapter 8 of the... Well, what we're told... The, the, the story heading is often women caught in adultery. Mm -hmm. But I've heard it said that story should really be called religious leaders caught with stones in their hands. Mm -hmm. um, and the reason I love that story so much is because Jesus, I mean, talk about a third way. Jesus neither endorses the religious rule keeping based on judgment of the Pharisees, but he also doesn't endorse the sinful lifestyle of the woman because he calls it sin. He doesn't say there, there, you know, let's justify why you may have done that. Poor you, you were triggered. And in a moment of weakness, you just, you know, he's like, no, go and leave your sin no more. Mm. But before he said that, he says, I don't judge you. And the problem is, I think, so often we're into judging and we're not into leaving our lives of sin. But Jesus isn't into judging and he's not into sin and so I think uh, uh, what we often do is we, we moralize what I what I mean by that is the number of people who will talk to me about living with these young men who are in gangs or drugs as bad people but Pete you're a good person and these are bad people no one would be quite as clunky as that in describing it but that's what people mean we, we see these things through a moral lens mm -hmm. And I don't think Jesus sees it through a moral lens because if it's through a moral lens, then we're all bad people, right? Yep. And so I think one of the things for me is to, um, the, my hope is the prophetic communities will look beyond the physical and just the things people have done. And actually in choosing proximity, in choosing people, will be able to minister into not the symptom or the, uh, the, the visible thing, but actually into the trauma, into the pain, into the hurts, into the generational sin of that person. Um, because honestly, every one of those young men who came to live with us, um, when their gang buddies are not around, when they're sitting on their bed, when they miss their mum who lives five minutes down the road, when they something doesn't go their way, they'll cry like little pre-teenage boys. And so this is not a moral thing that got them into gangs and drugs. This is just a um, whole host of hidden factors that I believe the prophetic uh, the prophets of the church will be able to see, will be able to unearth in kindness, and will be able to minister into, rather than what we see in the church so often these days, is just pointing fingers at, quote, bad people. Guys, give us a wave if you're really getting some revelation here. I feel like there's so much stuff happening in my brain and so much spin-off. I'm like... We're going to have to redo the whole of Vox Day to get all this information in there. Um, we're going to have to ask Pete to do a session um, on Kingdom for us again, actually teaching to Happy Pete. to, yeah. I'm so, it's been so cool just having you here. Um, I, I, I want to encourage you. I feel like God's actually speaking to numbers of you around this idea of proximity and the prophetic. And for some of you, God's going to, in this next season, get you ready to think about moving, get you ready to... Think about um, ways that will actually get you into spaces and places 
but that actually will cause your life to be the prophetic message, not just what you declare or decree. I, I really feel like, and I feel like God's hand is on some of you yeah, right now as yeah. you're listening to this and watching this. You're feeling the presence of God. And as things are being adjusted in your mind, I want to encourage you to ask God for clarity. Speak to Him. Connect with His heart. Because I, I do believe we are in a season where God is bringing um, reform to the prophetic movement yeah. for the sake of His voice being heard clearly and being demonstrated in genuine grace and beauty again. Um, and so I want to encourage you, that's kind of like, I feel like that's actually the prophetic word that God's speaking over many of you. Um, Pete, I love you. Just We just spoke this little phrase that you threw out there, the third way. Yeah. Um, just give us one or two more thoughts around third way, because Pete and I have been talking about this. I'm like, there has got to be a better way than just us doing what we're doing um, in terms of power ministry and social justice ministry. Yeah. A, a revival or reformation it's got to look different yeah i mean add to revival and social justice contemplative prayer um conservative evangelical love for the word silence of the quakers the strategy of the wesleyans the um music of the hillsong and vineyard movements the, you know, we can go on. We can. I think. I think the thing, the important thing, is that we don't for a minute think that we've got a monopoly on truth in mm. our stream of the church. Um, but an example of the third way in the physical first. Now, I hope we're all mature enough to be able to hold a story about Israel Palestine without freaking out. Um, go there. Go there. <laughs> I I went to Israel Palestine a couple of years ago and met the most phenomenal man called Daoud Nassar. And he is a Palestinian farmer living on a farm, his farm, that they've owned for a hundred years in his family and they've got the title deed for it. A Palestinian Christian living in um, the West Bank, which is uh, where Israel are building uh, lots of uh, settlements, uh, illegal settlements, according to the UN. You can debate that, that's not the point of the story. The point of the story for me is that as you drive up to the farm and you only get about 200 yards away and then you have to walk because rubble has been dumped and all sorts of other things by the occupiers. So you can't get there. So you walk up to the, the gate of the farm and as you get there, there's a pluck on the gate that says in many different languages, we refuse to be enemies with anybody. And so here is someone who's a Palestinian Christian. That is a minority in the midst of a Jewish Arab war, uh, or not war, you know, like a dispute, all of that. And here's a man whose almond trees and whose buildings have been uprooted over and over again out of um, uh, intimidation. And his crowning statement is, I refuse to be anybody's enemies. In fact, it was Abraham Lincoln who says, I destroy my enemies by making them my friends. And so for me, Dawood is not saying um, Hamas and, uh, you know, uh, uh, that is what the one way. Or he's not saying um, uh, Israel and uh, Zionism or whatever else is the, the way. He's saying, I refuse to be enemies with anybody and I'll embrace anybody. Now for us... The third way looks like that in the spirit. It looks like saying, you support Biden, you support Trump. I will embrace you in the spirit. And I'll see beyond all of that. Remember, we need to see beyond the physical as prophetic people. We need to know that uh, nationalism is not kingdom mindedness. We need to know that um, the, the, the world is growing in economic inequality. And that as prophetic people, we need to steward our personal prophetic words in order to um, disrupt and uh, bring a change in that trajectory. The third way is one of compassion, is one of saying, Lord, I want to weigh Christians, not count Christians, as Dallas Willard once said. Lord, I want to redefine success around not empirical metrics, but around faithfulness to the task that you've given me of testifying to the gospel of your grace. It's saying, I do not ever want my passion for raising the dead and seeing the blind uh, healed and seeing the demonized delivered, tempered 
by my um, my activist tendencies, and it's saying I will not allow my uh, revivalist friends to insulate me from the real needs of the world. The third way is the most beautiful narrow path. You will not be enough for either side. That's what we find over and over again. The revivalists say we're too justice oriented. The justice activists say we're too aligned to revivalism or this church or that church. And we say enough. We refuse to be enemies with anybody. That's the third way. Guys, I want to encourage you. Uh, Pete has got an incredible book called No Mutual Ground. Um, I'm sure Jess will get the link to that. Um, also on our website, Pete, um, um, Church Community called Tree of Life is one of our featured charities that we are working with consistently and over a long time. Um, and so if you want to give, feel free to do that. Guys, I know that I hijacked our Q&A to have <laughs> Pete with us. Um, I hope you're being encouraged. I hope it's really shaping the way you think because I feel like uh, I, what I want to do, just I'm going to ask Pete particularly to pray for us and to release um, grace for us to step into some of this in terms of how we think prophetically um, and how we can shape some things prophetically. I know I, I, we haven't got to be able to prophesy over individuals today, but I, I just feel like they, I literally sense the presence of God. I'm not just saying that for effect, um, but I feel like there's something on this idea of prophets of proximity mm. um, that we get into the mess. And the mess is going to look different for all of us but we need to be willing to get into it. Yeah. Um, and, and I want to encourage you, just, I'm going to ask Pete just to end uh, in, in some prayer. I will redeem the Q&A time. We'll do it again, um, but I, I, I'm super excited. We've got some amazing things coming up soon, but Pete, why don't you just pray for us? Yeah. Um, yeah. Julian, as you were talking, I was just reminded of what can be, come across as a bit of a cliche, but I think is really quite profound. And I feel the Spirit saying it to us now. And that is that the heart of the human problem is the problem of the mm. human heart, not the problem of human systems, not the problem of this and this and this, but the, ultimately the problem of the human heart. And so I pray for each person on this Zoom call, each person uh, listening, each person who is maybe watching this later on, that, Father, you would help us to come up with prophetic, creative solutions to the problems of the human heart, to the outworkings of that in society. But at the same time, Lord Jesus, that we would be obsessed with faithfulness, mm. that we would be obsessed with not effectiveness, but truth, that we would be obsessed, Lord Jesus, with you weighing us, not counting us. I pray, Heavenly Father, that you would open gates ancient doors, things that have been left closed for decades and centuries in the lives of those listening, in the generational lines of those listening, that you would open things up that need opening up, old wells, and that you would close doors of uh, access that have been open for generations, uh, that have ravaged lives and families. I pray, Holy Spirit, that you would bring about a new wave of inner healing prophetic ministry. Mm -hmm. I pray, Lord Jesus, Jesus, for each person listening, for just a zeal and just a hunger and thirst for deliverance, because if the gospel is not changing us, how can we expect it to change others? I pray, Lord Jesus, for the mountains to be made low, and as the valleys are being raised up, that you would give listeners and people in the Vox Dei uh, uh, community revelation as to which valleys you are calling them to minister into. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, thanks for watching this video. It's part of my 12-session online school called Vox Day. Head over to voxdayschool.com to find out a little bit more about this and join us for our next live session.